Boys, it's Mudge here, and we're in the brand spanking new, only just been released uh, MiG 21 BIS in DCS. Um, now, this will be my first actual flight, my first time off the ground. Um, I I've done the startup tutorial about three times just to get my head around it, and I think I know what I'm doing. Um, that's a, a definite think. <laughs> it might not. Uh, it might not go too well, but we're gonna give it a try. Um, now, like I said, this has only just been released. Um, it's uh, it's still in kind of like a beta phase, but um, you can kind of get your hands on it and fly it now from the DCS website. Um, now the MiG twenty one. It's a uh, kind of a high speed interceptor. Um, it's not really much for a, a dogfighting type of aircraft it was just kind of designed to um, kind of get airborne as, as quickly as possible go supersonic intercept um, enemy invaders you know things like the American b-52 uh, shoot them down and then return home you know it was uh, de designed as a deterrent I guess uh, kind of during the, the start and mid of the Cold War um, now checking up on my history uh, the MiG-21 uh, had its first flight or the first prototype flew on the 14th of February 1956 uh, and that just shows how old this aircraft uh, but it first went into uh, active service I believe in 1959 and since then it's um, had the award of being kind of one of the most heavily produced and one of the most heavily exported aircraft in the world uh, and I guess that probably speaks volumes about the aircraft you know it's um it's a complete steam-driven aircraft. There's nothing really that complicated about it, although it is an incredibly complicated aircraft to fly. Um, I mean, the reason it's probably mass-produced, and that being Soviet, is probably cheaper or cheaper than the, the Western alternatives, which at the time would have been kind of the F-4 Phantom, uh, A-4 Skyhawk, things like that, around that sort of generation. So what we're going to do now um, is that we're going to see if we can start this up, or at least see if I can remember how to start it up. Um, we'll see if we can take off. It's not something I've done yet in the sim, so it's going to be a very interesting um, interesting experience. And I'm just kind of looking around the cockpit here, kind of panicking, because I'm just trying to remember where all of the switches are. I really don't know what I'm doing. Okay, so let's make a start. Now, just to make you aware... Um, my track IR, because I'm using the track hat rather than the track clip because it broke a few weeks ago, it, it kind of wobbles and shakes when I'm looking at switches, so uh, I'm kind of using a pause button so I can kind of um, kind of look at the switches and manipulate them without kind of the, the, the track IR shaking around, so if it gets a bit jarring I do apologise about that. So, right, um, now a lot of the electronic switches and the first switches that we need are over on this side of the cockpit. Um, I kind of know that much. Um, a lot of the uh, avionics type of systems, I believe, are over on this side, including things like flaps, um, things to do with the intake and engine management controls. I've spent some time just kind of going around, uh, going around the cockpit, kind of looking at the tooltips, just finding out each, what each kind of switch does. Um, so I'm I'm starting to kind of learn the cockpit as such. Um, Although, like the DCS A10, this is going to take a little bit of time. Um, I've not gone into any of the weapons or navigation systems yet. Um, and the manual is about 200 pages long. It's, well, it's 185, if I remember right, from cover to cover. And uh, it seems as though two-thirds of that is just all based around kind of navigation. <laughs> so, you know, how to use things like ground... Uh, uh, ground intercepts, uh, air intercepts, things like that, and then you've got all kinds of uh, radio homing beacons and things like that. So I guess kind of with the MiG-21 being a, a interceptor, it was all about kind of um, uh, getting airborne, kind of intercepting uh, the, the targets when we're coming in, but with it only having a very limited radar and no kind of GPS, I guess that they needed those homing beacons in order to triangulate where the aircraft was so that the pilot didn't get lost when flying over the, the Bering Straits and things like that, I imagine. So, But anyways, enough digressing, so let's get on with the startup. Um, now the first thing is to turn on the inverters, which are on these three switches down here. Um, all of these, I guess, are circuit breakers. We don't really need to touch those as such yet. Uh, the next step is to turn on the battery. Ooh, see, lights, how about that? And some very annoying sounds, and the DC ground power. 
uh, and because we've turned on the DC ground power the next step is to turn on the um, bloody buttons there we go turn on the ground power uh, so we'll turn, Machine, on, turn on the ground power please turn on the ground power now you hear like a, a humming in the background um, I hear that too ground power is now on. Uh, I guess that's uh, probably something to do with feedback through the mics and things but as we start switching everything on a that does go away I believe um, so let's kind of uh, continue on anyway so that's that that's that the next I believe would be the um, fuel inverters uh, yeah fuel inverters what am I on about fuel pumps that's on the inverters that's the inverters that's the fuel pumps yeah. I'm getting it like I said this is only be like the second time I've actually kind of started up this aircraft <laughs> or third time even uh, so then it's the fire extinguisher on and APU on, or aircraft APU. Although normally with uh, APUs you normally get like a, a high pitched whining sound saying that, um, that that's coming to life, but don't seem to be getting that in this. Don't know if I'm doing something wrong, but hey ho, there we go. It's all a learning experience. And they're all to do with radar, radar, um, aircraft generators. I guess that's once, that, once we get the air engine up and running. So. Uh, and the next step is to hold down this button here, uh, which is the engine start button. And in fact, no, it's not. Um, I forgot something to uncage the throttle and then move it up into minimum. <laughs> uh, so yeah, we hold down this, which is the engine start button, then we keep an eye on the RPM gauge. And as soon as the N1 uh, engine RPM needle starts lifting, then we can get let go of the engine start button. So let's see if we can't do that now. So we press and hold that down. We come over here and then keep an eye on the um, engine RPM gauge. <coughs> now it does seem to be kind of warbling in sound, but it did that during the startup tutorial as well, so I'm kind of not really worried about that. There we go, okay, so the needle's starting to climb now. Right, so we'll release the... Um, just reset my track over there, so we on it, so there we go. Okay, so the engine RPM needles are climbing up. So that's good, that means that the engine's starting. That's a positive. That's the warning still flashing over something. And then as that starts climbing, we move the throttle back into idle so that the uh, aircraft doesn't move. And then I believe they settle about 40 to 50. So there we go, yeah, that seems to kind of be steady there. So then we turn on um, these three switches here, which also include the uh, aircraft generator, which means that the engine should now be powering the aircraft. And we turn on um, these things. I believe the SAU is the autopilot. Um, now you've got like SAU recovery mode, so I think if you start getting into a bit of trouble, uh, if the aircraft starts to spin, then you can um, kind of recover that way. And then we've got some switches along here, so it's this row of switches to switch on and then this top line of switches here which all kind of power different systems inside the aircraft. I don't really know what each individual one does um, although you can kind of hover over it with your with your mouse if you want to have a look at the um, tool tips to find out what exactly each individual one does. And then the next step I believe is to close the canopy. So the first thing that you do is that you unpack this bar so you just click on that there. <laughs> that closes the canopy. You then click it again I believe at least that's what happens in a tutorial, it won't let you progress unless you click that again, maybe it just kind of locks a shutter or something like that. And then down here, uh, this is the uh, canopy secure and seal, so what you do is a two-stage thing, you um, secure the canopy, and then you get a, like a little blinky LED here which is quite cool, and then you move that across, and then you get a nice little sucking sound which shows that the, um, that the seal around the canopy is uh, shut, so I guess that kind of um, atmospherically seals the uh, the cockpit ready for high altitude flights or something along those lines. And then the last step is put the flaps into takeoff. So, uh, so on the switches here uh, you've got uh, normal or up, uh, takeoff and landing. Um, yeah. uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. I think that's everything. I don't think I've missed anything in particular there. I think that we're almost ready to go. Uh, so what we'll do, um, like I said, when it comes to weapons and things like that, I've really not covered any of that, so I'm not going to kind of get into that yet. Um, 
Also, I was reading through the manual. Um, I know that there's a couple of things that you need to check before taxiing. Um, I'm trying to remember where it is. It's uh, here, yep, so you've got, uh, there it is, ABS on, and it's on as default. And then you've got uh, this switch here, which is the nose wheel, um, or nose, yeah, nose brake, or no, nose gear brake. Uh, you need to turn that, um, you've got navigating, which is up, and then landing like that, which uh, turns on the nose brake. So when you're taxiing, I believe you have that in the up position, if I'm kind of remembering this correctly. And then when you're landing, you put it into um, into that position because that engages the nose brake. And how this aircraft works is that you can turn the nose gear with the pedals. Uh, but in order to turn tighter, what you do is that you kind of uh, rudder in you then pull in the wheel brake and then that allows you to, to turn tighter and there's a, a gauge down here I believe it is so if we turn that that will show you kind of um, which wheel brake is getting pressure and then if you leave that even then both wheels get pressure and then that's kind of the brakes being engaged uh, but that's all um, kind of limited compressed air, but it's, it's fed by the engine, so as you're kind of um, powering up the engine, that should then... Um, uh, yeah, that should refill that, or at least that's the hope. Um, so hey, what are you doing? Oops, I forgot to switch off the ground power. My bad. <laughs> I'm allowed to make mistakes. This is kind of like the, the first time I've, I've taken this aircraft out the hangar. So that's me kind of full steering so a little bit of tap of the brakes there just to help it turn around the corner um, I'm really panicking I've forgotten something here um, now I have been in set up some hotel controls just kind of look through many I don't really know what many of them do so I've, I know I've got trim set up but it, it doesn't appear as though there's any kind of uh, air um, trim yeah there's just elevator trim so there's just up and down there's no left and right um, so I guess that being a, a jet aircraft, it doesn't really need that. So at least I hope I don't need it. But uh, what I'm thinking is, if, if you are carrying a, a asymmetric load, or if you fire off a, a, a missile or two, then it's going to cause the aircraft to roll. And without having a lateral trim or aileron trim, that's going to make that a bit of a pain in the ass. But um, I've not got into any of the weapon systems like I've said yet. This is just simply my, my first flight actually kind of trying to get this thing off the ground. So we'll see how this goes. Um, again, I'm just kind of looking around. Okay, so this looks like a, a G meter. See an artificial horizon, although I think that's cage. Is that one cage? I think, but I don't know why those tabs haven't disappeared, I don't know, maybe I'm missing something in regards to that. Um, so it looks like altimeter, speed maybe, <laughs> uh, rise and descent indicator, um, I don't know what that does. Um, I think they're all to do with uh, fuel kind of engine type stuff here. <laughs> Like I said, this is my first experience in the aircraft, so I'm literally learning this as I'm going. And uh, I'm sure that within the next few days I'll spend a bit more time with this kind of... Um, finding out exactly what I'm doing, and we'll, um, I'll put up some more videos kind of showing my experiences, what I've learned, and, and maybe even see if I can help, uh, help you viewers kind of uh, get to grips with this if you're struggling. <laughs> uh, like what I seem to be at the moment. So we're nearly at the runway here, which is good. Um, yep, I think. <coughs> so here we go, we'll just turn on to the centre line. And just straighten up. And we'll just hold this here, we'll put the wheel brakes into landing, which turns on the nose wheel uh, landing brake. So that should hold us a bit better. And if we go external, we can just kind of have a good look around the aircraft now. And the detail on this is absolutely amazing. Um, just even kind of looking at all of like the little marks and things like this, the, every nut and rivet 
just looks absolutely fantastic. You know, I just for a third-party developer, uh, Level Neck uh, Simulations, I believe uh, was the name of the guys that make this. They really have gone beyond and above and beyond. You know, this has to be possibly, apart from maybe the A10C, one of the most in-depth and complex um, recreations of a of an aircraft I think I've ever seen in any flight sim ever to be honest and I think that's that's definitely high praise or at least the, the highest praise you can possibly give to any sim you know so right what we're going to do here um, I'm going to hold the brakes in I'm going to power up to about 100% throttle um, release the brakes kick in the afterburner and I hope that we don't die so fingers crossed and here we go so brakes in I'm going to start powering up and there's the nose wheel dipping down under under the load of um, almost several thousand pounds of thrust coming out of the engine. And I'll release the brakes now. Well out. Kick in the afterburner. How freaking cool is that one? That's a lovely that afterburner effect. But anyways, don't want to be looking at that too much, so there we go. That's I think about 300, that should be enough, so we'll start pulling back on the stick now. And we're airborne kind of thing. Now, with the undercarriage, it's a two-step process. You need to pull out like a retaining pin, then move the undercarriage up, and then that should start coming up now, which I can hear it is. And we've got three lock lights, and then we put the flaps up there. So that's us. Airborne. <laughs> oh, crikey, here we go. Okay, so the nose wants to dip, so I'm just kind of trimming back here on the stick, just um, kind of giving me a, a, a positive rate of climb here with, uh, without pulling up too hard on the stick. Um, now, from what I understand with this aircraft as well, it's got a very kind of limited um, bank uh, kind of turn angle. Um, I believe this instrument here is the turn and bank indicator, and as you can see, there's a limit around 20 degrees um, and a red line at 30 so I guess that we're not supposed to pass that so what I'll do is that I'll just come off the afterburners here uh, we're doing about 800 kilometers an hour I think that would be measured in possibly and then what we'll do is that we'll roll over and start pulling some pitch so we go that's about 4 G's and that's about 20 degrees bank so she's turning quite happily there let's start pushing it past that Okay, so oh, that's interesting. So that's about the limits of, of the turn right there. Now, when we started turning there, as you can see, as you start getting close, the, the pito, pito probe on the front seems to be vibrating. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. And then as we start kind of getting more towards the limits, cockpit starts vibrating. And then you get red lights. So those red lights on there mean that we're pushing too hard. So that's... Oh, hello. That's interesting. Okie dokie. Let's see how quick she climbs. So I'm going to kick in the afterburners here. Okay, so I guess that's the burners going there. And then we'll stick the nose up a bit here. 30 degrees nose up bank there. Let's keep going shoot for the moon as they say. So it's about 40 degrees nose up there. Speed's still looking good but then again we are uh, we are like an absolute rocket. Oops. <laughs> Wrong button. I'm trying to take a screenshot there. one of the nicest afterburn effects I've seen. Okay, so this thing definitely climbs like a rocket ship. I think that could be a fuel indicator there. Um, if so then that's not good because it means that we're using fuel really quickly. <laughs> that's definitely not um, not very good. But yeah the rate of climb on this thing is insane man. This thing's going up like a rocket ship. What are we at now? So that's about 20,000? I guess that would be 20,000 meters. Would that be right? 2,000 2, meters, maybe. So, 
24,000 feet, I guess. Ah, interesting. Right, so let's uh, get that out. So it's quite easy to push this thing into its turning limits there. And then there's our long leg right below us, so it's definitely a pretty quick rate of climb. Now, from what I understand, the maximum speed on this is about Mach 2. Um, I can't... Could that be a Mach meter? I guess that's our Mach meter there, yeah, so there we go. So that tops out about 3. So let's kick in the afterburner again here. Let's go full throttle. Let's see if we can't dive down and see how fast we can go in a shallow dive. So here we go, now we're coming downstairs like a bat out of hell. So that's about 0.8. It's trimming down here because the nose wants to climb quite rapidly you now. So there we go, that's about Mach 1. Again, got the afterburners pinned here, so our speed needle there is pretty much pinned. So we're almost, yeah, that's just past the Mach there in a, in a shallow dive. And now she's definitely started to climb, so that's about. Mac 1.1 coming up on 1.2. Shallow dive here. That's Mac 1.2. Let's have a look. Yeah. <laughs> now this is one of the effects I love in DCS is that when you're ahead of the aircraft, that's going fast on speed of sound. Nothing and. Nothing. Sound. Nothing. Sound. <laughs> simple things please simple minds as they say. So there we go, that's uh that's us doing back 1.1, pretty much straight and level now, with full afterburn run, so that's definitely no slouch. And let's go straight up here and see how fast we can play. Again pull so that's six G here and pull up cranky and the guy's not blacking out. I guess those uh, G suits really do the trick. <laughs> oh wow. Master caution there, that's uh... Oh shit, hang on. What's going on? Menjin died. Engine RPM levels are diving, I've got the throttle pinned forward. Crap. Um, don't panic, I seem to have lost the engine. Um, okay, 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 that's not good. Um, I did see something over here which was emergency air start. So let's pin that up. Okay, so that's you coming back to life. Please. I'm starting to run out of... Okay, there we go. How about that? <laughs> Bit of emergency procedure there, so that's the engine restarted. Whew! Thank God I noticed that thing the other, uh, when I was doing um, when I was doing a training. <laughs> Well, that definitely worked. So there's an emergency procedure for you. Don't stick your, your nose up too much, otherwise your engine shuts off. No, that wasn't fun. I had my uh, my sphincter going kind of tented a dozen. <laughs> okay, so uh, yeah, as we were passing about um, what, about 500 kilometers an hour or so, I think I believe it's kilometers an hour with the nose up there, the engine just kind of shut itself off. That was uh, that was an interesting experience. But that was uh, that was quite easy to relight there as well, so uh, that's not bad. So what we'll do here is that we'll head back to the head back to our airfield, which I believe is this way, and we'll see if we can't land. <laughs> Dokey. So so I'm just going to start backing off my throttles here. Uh, we're still going pretty fast here. Um, at 0 0.8.
Now, from what I was reading in the manual as well, I've, I've not kind of completed the manual yet, I've just been reading through a lot of the um, kind of flying startup procedures. Uh, the it has a thing called an SAU, uh, which I believe is the um, autopilot, and it does have an autopilot assisted landing um, mode, so you can kind of tell the autopilot to land you, and it's also got things like um, um, like altitude hold and stability, which I believe is on this button, or one of these buttons around here, I'm not sure I saw it. No, yeah, so you've got SAU cancel currently. I'm sure that that button there was working in the training that I did. That was for a, a recovery mode. And then that kind of uh, just locks the aircraft uh, straight, steady and level. So that's our runway over there. So I'm just going to start pulling off on the throttles a bit more here just to slow us down. But with the flight characteristics of this aircraft, you don't want to go too slow. Otherwise it drops like a stone. Um, so I believe anything less than kind of five to four hundred then your flight performance kind of goes out the window and uh, Yeah, the, the aircraft kind of then refuses to fly So I'm just gonna kind of fly in towards the runway here and then we'll, uh, we'll put down the um, we'll Flap some undercarriage And see if we can't get it down safely on the ground now, like I said, this is my first flight. This is the first time I've, I've actually kind of get this thing off the ground. And <laughs> I hope that I'm not being too painful when you're watching this. Um, again, if you've, you know, kind of got tips and things like that, please feel free to leave in the comments. And, you know, uh, if I'm doing something wrong, then by all means, kind of, please let me know. And uh, over the next couple of days, I'm, I'm kind of going to spend a bit more time with this and, and see if I can uh, the, the flaps down there. So we're kind of slowing down here. Um, down, down, the carriage. down there we go, yep. I'll start turning for landing. Yeah, so like I was saying there, if I'm doing anything wrong or if um, you know if my procedures aren't exactly right, then please let me know kind of if I can do something better. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm gonna spend more time with this aircraft kind of learning what everything does and why it does it and then uh, I'll hopefully have some more videos up within the next couple of days um, maybe even featuring um, kind of how to use some navigation systems and also maybe how to use uh, the radar okay, that's interesting so that sounds like the outer beacon um, yeah. and I wonder if this thing actually has ILS I mean it's got seems to have the needles for it so may even be able to do um, some kind of uh, guided or assisted landing. Okay, so I think I'm pretty much lined up here with the runway, although it is hard to see over that nose. Okay, speed's okay, I think about 300 to 350 should be okay. Slightly right here, in a marker. So I'm just coming off the, the power here, and slightly high, I think. So coming downhill fast, start blowing up, sink rate's quite high. Ooh, sugary shite. Um, I think I've broken something now. <laughs> Deployed a drag chute. I think I must have bent under there. Yep. Yeah, I must have snapped one of the undercarriage bars there. <laughs> Not the greatest landing ever, but for my first attempt, <laughs> I think that's kind of excusable, maybe. I don't know. Just punish me in the comments. But hey, as I say, any landing you can walk away from is a good one. <laughs> well, I think my crew chief's going to uh, break my legs. Um, okay. So that sister is slowing down on the old drag chute there. Now, I did see a thing the other thing here, drag chute release. I will, so that kind of dumps the parachute. And let's see if we can't... Uh, So, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. So it's not feeding. Oh, yeah, it's feeding the brakes there, but it's not really slowing down. Um, so, 
so that's the engine into stop there is it is that slow yep yeah, okay so that's killed the engine that's good Yeah, so that's just kind of down and alive. <laughs> right, okay, well, this, like I said, this has been my first experience with um, with the MiG-21. I hope that you've enjoyed this video. It has certainly kind of been an experience making it. Can you open? How, how do we open the canopy now? Oh, okay, don't know how to open the canopy yet. Ah, there we go. Ah, click that thing. There we go, so that's the canopy open. And eject. <laughs> Thank God for zero zero ejections each. So let's see if we can walk over and have a have a quick look at it from the outside. Would have been nice to get out without um, without having to eject. But there we go interesting so we've got canopy there and canopy there awesome and the seat is the seat missing the seat is missing that's quite cool i like that All right so yeah anyways that's the um that's the mig 21 um i hope that you've enjoyed this video um i'll certainly have more videos up within the the, the coming days um hopefully with um with uh, more kind of uh, information featuring things like the well, uh, <laughs> featuring the uh, the radar systems, navigation systems, things like that. Um, so yeah, we'll hopefully see you next time. And this is Smudge signing off.